Nice to meet you here. You know, uh, mining talk will like show lots of practical examples and we will dive into code as well. Like, uh, how did Bakot make it? First of all, why you find Docker Market? Because well, I also serve developer uh, from a code bar company from Estonia. Uh, I love uh, unit tests, so all kinds of automated tests, integration tests, and so on. I love the clean development, extreme programming, clean code. I talk a lot about it, and they especially love open source, and they do several open source projects. Uh, probably the most famous of them is Cinemate, which is an open source library for automated tests in Java. Uh, and because I am maintaining this and some other open source projects, I often need to answer all the same questions all the time. So why this method doesn't work? Why my browser doesn't open? Why is this downloading is hanging? And I am answering all many, many times the same questions. So that's why I want to come and show like the most typical problems in most typical ways how to solve them, how to debug typical problems with this automated test. Uh, what it started from? I saw another talk on some developer conference uh, this, uh, from my friend, Anton Zipos, uh, who talked about debugging in IntelliJ. His product manager or product owner in JetBrains, he was talking about how to debug Java code in general, and he said uh, uh, one sentence, what that seems funny to me. He said, of course you need debugging only if you don't have this. If you have tests for your code, then you don't need to debug. And this was very funny for me. <laughs> it's not too lot, actually. In fact, when you do write it, you need to debug quite a lot. And we are going to talk about it. Uh, yeah, sometimes when you have some pictures of Estonia, uh, it's probably quite different from Portugal. We have snow there right now, and minus 10, probably. But it's beautiful. Uh, so the question is, what do you do when some test has failed? What most people do in this case? Exactly. What most people do? They say, "Well, give me a keyboard and here on the test." And different tools like Gradle, Gradle Enterprise, and so on even suggest to you as a best practice. Cool. Hey, we can really run your test for you. Mm, nice. What you actually should do instead? Actually, you should like debug the extent why the test failed. Uh, and we, let's uh, start from different uh, uh, like practices, from the really simple ones to more complex ones. The first, all well, you know, the sentence reads like with the fact model, uh, we will read different things. First of all, read the error message. Uh, this is the most obvious thing that very often people don't do. Very often people see the test has failed and they say, hey, I know, I know. We need to increase payouts. We need to change some option like that. They don't even look into a message and don't even read in details what is written there. It's often uh, said explicitly that actually the problem was not this timeout, was not this option, but they just change timeout in the app without thinking. This is the most important. Practice, actually, read their message. Think about it. What was written here? And by the sequence, or well, consequence, you you should prefer tools that generate good error message. It I like error message. Let me show an example. Uh, here we have some typical uh, like web test for browser, and we have two tests. The first one checks that the result is visible. This is a very cool and very typical test. A third test, some element is displayed is true, or even something like that. A third true, people often say, like an event, it displayed, right? Even like that. What's for on this test? Yeah, we, have, we can even work. Uh, do another test. What's for on this test? Okay, so yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. When we run, when we run this test, uh, the output, the error message, is not really useful. 
If you look uh, how failed this test, this test failed with the message that, well, you expect it true, but actual value was false. Is it useful? Not really. Well, great features that you can click to see difference. Uh, but yes, still, <laughs> still it's not useful. Uh, it is even worse, probably. Okay, it's all the same, yeah. But there are tools that uh, show best to, to generate and read lower messages. One of them is Serenade. Uh, in Serenade, you write like a similar uh, check, like this, some admin should be visible. When you write like this, when you use, uh, or use Serenade syntax, then it can generate very, very detailed, detailed error messages. It says explicitly recommend not followed what was expected. Expected positive element should be visible, and additionally, it provides as much information as possible. The selector of this element, what was screenshot at that moment, what was page source at that moment. Uh, well, here we can see screenshot. Okay, it's too long. Mm -hmm. uh, and so on, what was allowed, and some original codes of this program, and so on and so on. So, preferred tools that generate good error message. Uh, one, another tool is assert J which is really great, like in that sense. Uh, yeah, I am just duplicating the same information on slides, like to so somebody who will be, uh, who will watch the, the talk, yeah. If we are uh, compared to our messages, they are totally different in terms of usability or use of MS. I will share like in Twitter immediately, so you can read there, watch all the slides. Uh, like that. Like add a lot of messages. When you have some text, or you have some good green text working, try to break it. Try to change something. Try to make your build a file and look at the generated error message. Read this, read this error and try to understand is it really useful? Is it, is it really clear? Can, yeah, is it readable and debatable? Yeah. Can you understand what happened here if it, it happens? someday, if this test fails someday. Can you really understand what happened, why, and how to fix it? Uh, this is actually the first step of test-driven development, TDD. All right, all right. You, see, you must see your test all right, broken and understand what happened there. The so next technique is uh, read, or, uh, read dogs. This is often what people uh, don't do. Uh, uh, and don't pay attention to. Uh, let me show another example. For example, uh, here we have some simple test, very, very typical test, that will open a web page and like assert some search results, something like that. And if you run this test, it's, it's, it's very common. Yeah, probably it fails at some moment, and probably it can't even open a browser, and people are asking, hey, why can't I open even a browser? And I, I often see this red text here. And I often say, hey, you don't even have any logs in the console. Your logs are disabled, literally. Like, how can you understand at all what happens if you don't even have logs? And people often don't pay attention to it. <laughs> you are using you see big letters, you see red text, and they still don't see it. How it's possible, I don't understand. And actually, here is a thought room that shows what, what should you do to fix this problem. You just need to enable this log. Actually, this link says what for Xerix is the for j which is simple login Java facade, blah, blah. This is its interface, which has uh, several implementations. Log back, uh, log for j uh, something else, and you just need to pick one of them. So, login parallel you are using in your project. Uh, one most common options are log4j implementation of SLS4j or logback implementation. Or if you don't have any other options or opinions, then you probably just, just can pick up simple. SLS4j simple is a very simple implementation that is good enough in most cases, which is just write all the logs to console. It's, it's a very good choice by default if you don't have any others. And how to do it? All these tools, which is we just need to add a dependency, set up logging. Now, enable logging. Let's see what happened. We just have added yet another dependency to our projects, test on time only, 
this is a very simple. That is not very simple. And the logic will be reboot. If you try to do it right now, oops, oops, you still don't see logs. You still see this error message. What happened? Why don't we still have logs? Who can say? Rebuild? Or error not exactly, but you know, error close, but not exactly. Actually, not rebuild, but what, what people often forget or don't even know, actually, the more important part is to reload the project. This is a Gradle plugin on PDJ, and you actually need to reload this project. Now, this dependency will be added to the project, and now you will see the works. Uh huh, I still didn't see it. Why? Ah, okay, I already probably had some slow insights, something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, after rewarding the project, we will see the works. Uh, yeah, now we have works. Another, uh, another question is how to probably enable or disable some debug clocks, some specific clocks, and yeah, we can do it with initial configuration. Uh, let's go to the next part. Uh, in order, like, what is when you saw, uh, have some random bits that the previous build was screen and now you have right build, and another good idea is to compare the log of clean build and the log of red build and watch the difference, find the difference. Sometimes it's uh, complex. Uh, 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 yeah, I will do it later. Okay. I just uh, mentioned that I had I created in GitHub a project with several exercises for debugging automatic tests. If you want to try it out, you can open this GitHub. And I will add more exercises later. Uh, and, and next, next uh, technique is to read stack trace. This is incredibly simple, but incred incredibly like underestimated uh, thing that people often don't know how to do. Uh, you need to read not only the first error message, but the full stack trace. And the most important part is usually in, in the bottom of the stack trace, where the last post body part. People often don't do it. For example, this is this was uh, one question recently sent to me. So, hey, why cannot I run my similar test? And they are showing when I ask to show a message, they are showing something like that. And it really doesn't contain anything useful. Don't don't read it. It doesn't contain anything useful. People often truncate this trace. They often leave only the first part. And they always ask you, please scroll down. Please send the full trace. Then you read. Uh, scroll down and read the full stack trace uh, and find somewhere the last coast by part. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> yes. Sometimes stack trace is so available. Uh, and you need to find the last coast by part. And actually, if you increase the font, we will see that last coast by part says that you have illegal key values in browsing capabilities. And for those who know browsers, they know that Ah, actually, yes, I know, I know. Name is called capability. You need to use some mirror capability, like this in And you can find it only in the last coast by in the stack trace. Uh, another similar example also was uh, like very similar. People say that, hey, I, I can run tests. I say that, hey, yeah, read through the full stack trace. And again, in the last coast by was my uh, message like this. And you probably already know what it means. It means that the library they tried to use uh, what that was compiled for Java 11, but they tried to run tests on Java 8. Very simple explanation, but it was hidden in the bottom of the stack trace. So always read the full stack trace. And the full example of real life example showing most things uh, is a real problem, a real bug caused. Uh, after upgrading my project from Atrium 8.5 to Atrium 8.6, my test started failing with uh, uh, error saying timeout. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. error message was like this session not create exception, blah blah blah. Then I said, okay, let's scroll down and new full stack trace. Let's find the last post by, and the last post by gave a little bit more information, timeout exception. Nice, but still. Why? What happened? Hard to understand. Timeout is not the melodic exception for it because you never know why timeout happened. Then comes uh, the next idea. What if we compare log 
of successful build and local failure build. And I, I did it. I created local successful build and failure build. I went on that. Ah, yeah. Hello. Ah. Here we have local successful builds and local failed builds. And we can compare them. Uh, compare files. Uh -huh. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to compare two long logs. We see that a lot, lot different here. On the left is failed, on the right is okay built. Yes, some random port is deeply different than the log across part is okay, except upper version. Upper version is different. Okay, it's, it's expected. Again, all other jars are equal. Scroll, scroll, scroll down. Sometimes it's stirring. Yeah. Uh, and finally, yeah, in the end, uh, okay, scroll down to the end. And then we see that, okay, here we have this file. See, here it was okay. Here we have like report, failed steps, passive steps. Okay, this is expected. But where is the real difference? And finally, yeah, we have some like different dollars folder, blah, blah. Okay, it's like you can. Another very special skill is to ignore all unrelated details. What is really important here is actually this part. Actually, we see that when test uh, was green, then we used our mode 10 minutes. This is period of time 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And when the test failed, we see our mode 20 seconds. This is the only difference. This is the key difference, what we, that we can call file only from logs. Uh, here is the question, why timeout changed after updating up here? This, this is the question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because actually in our code, I checked, yeah, I checked that in our code, we always set this timeout, 20 seconds. Always. Before updating up here, after updating up here, always. The question is, why we didn't fail before? Why it started painting all the after operating at them? That the question from the answer is like, why? <laughs> the answer is that in APO, a type of Tokyo, there was a bug officially registered GitHub issue that said that this timeout is ignored. It was ignored. I tried to read the ticker, but it was ignored. It was still convenient. And in April uh, 6, they fixed this bug. And now my timeout is applied. And uh, yeah, I am getting the multi section. So, very, very unobvious part, which I could uh, understand all the from reading stuff price and comparing blocks of two bills. Uh, and uh, the next thing, uh, read the sources. This is also another thing that often, often people don't, uh, don't use or not know that they can use. Uh, the way of Whatever. Uh, if you ever ask uh, how works some method of selenite, of selenium, or to unit, and so on, you often can just look into the source code. Just can click to any of this method. For example, to store methods, and you just you will see the source code in this uh, method. Or this method, this here, you can see the source code. Or this method, you can see the source code. If IntelliJ already has downloaded it, or if not, then IntelliJ will see or will show this picture. And the magic button actually is here. Very often people don't know it. That so IntelliJ you can click, uh, go to any method and click this button, download sources. Just in the JL you download sources and show you all the sources of the library. This is the power of open source. You can read all the sources of Selenium, JUnit, ResearchJ of many libraries, whatever you want. So yeah, if you ever wondered how any of these libraries works, just go to the engine sources. Easy. It's not always easy. Some libraries are written in so complex way, for example, Hibernate, that it's quite impossible to read and to understand what it does. But still, it's possible and you can do it. Uh, another trick that often people don't know, uh, then you, uh, for example, you see error message in your stack trace. And if you want to understand which library it got generate this error message, where it comes from, you can look and uh, search this text in the source code. Okay, in this text, I uh, know. Uh, 
let's open another project. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you see this error message, but you, if when you try to find it in source code, you cannot find it because your project does not contain such text. And very often people don't know that actually you can select another scope here. You can click scope. And by the old here is like project files, otherwise. But you should change scope and select, for example, project and libraries. And you can search this text in all the libraries you are using Selenium, Cherry Writer Units, and so on. And yes, you go, you can find such text actually in Google libraries, but not in Cherry Writer in this case. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, in order, in order to search it in Cherry Writer, also you need to go and make a uh, leader download, you know, then it will uh, search in Cinema Dosso. Still doesn't appear. Okay, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, respect uh, other source code and treat it and, and debug it. Uh, here, debugging tips that often people don't know, and I also didn't know like some years ago. The first debugging tip is. Uh, that IntelliJ, you can choose how they want to run this. Uh, let me show. Mm -hmm. When you just run or debug any code in this, uh, often you don't know, but by default, IntelliJ runs it uh, using Cradle. And actually, there is an uh, option to choose it. When you go to settings of media, you can here select we want to compile the project using Gradle, which is by default, or using IntelliJ. And how uh, do we want to run the tests? Again, by default is Gradle, and I personally prefer to run that with IntelliJ, because it seems to me that in this case, you will see a better output, often uh, you will see better message and so on. So this is my recommendation. So use IntelliJ. Yeah, better message, but it's sometimes, not always. And the most powerful feature of any debugger always is a uh, feature called evaluate expression. Again, many people don't even know it, but you can actually can put breakpoints to absolutely all ways. Like this. In your tests or, you know, in other third party libraries. And we can stop at this track point. And you can evaluate expression. What it means. Uh, like I am used Alt F8 uh, shortcut, but if you don't shortcuts, don't all shortcuts, you can here select evaluate expression. Right? And you can run absolutely any actions right here in this dialog while in this this is printed. For example, we can call any methods like click. You can uh, check does it works. How to like that? You can see that this line didn't really work. It failed. I hope we will see it right now. Yeah, sometimes the variation will take time if it's say remote system like browser. Uh, and probably the most important part, you can paste different selectors here. Often people don't know how to find the proper selector. The will uh, really work something like that, or the the one something like that, and we can even we already check it. Something like that, yeah, it will work. Okay, in this case, something is frozen, but yeah, to anybody. Uh, then it's a good idea. So, well, it's expression and, uh, for example, find a good selector here. Or using inner HTML records, you can find HTML of this uh, element and read what, what elements it contains and so on. Uh, another uh, good uh, practice that people often don't know. That you can put breakpoint on exception, not on the line. This is this was a breakpoint on line. So whenever a test uh, arrives, the slide it will suspend your program. But this is only one kind of breakpoints. Actually, there's many many kinds of breakpoints. Ah, uh, too big fault. Well, that presentation. Oh, or, uh, and actually, you can create different types of breakpoints. Java line breakpoint is the odd one, like the most common one. But for example, you can create Java exception breakpoint. What it means? It means that uh, your test will suspend when some exception is uh, thrown. For example, some something like null exception 
whenever any code falls in one exception, the test will suspend and you can see who did it, why who did it. Or any other exceptions like uh, downloading files and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, and another interesting option is that uh, great one. Okay, let me show. Let's take some tests that downloads a file, for example. Yeah. We have here some tests that downloads a file. Let me debug it, run in debug mode. Okay. Well, now the text is going to download the file. And we are suspended on this breakpoint. And now probably we want to investigate some what is on this page. We want to meanwhile click some links, something like that. And then I, uh, well, when we tried to, okay, it was for a small demo effect. What should you? Sorry. Uh, Oh, interesting. Ah, okay, it was the wrong place. Yeah. Now, actually, I have to stop there on another, like like this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now we have opened at some page, and we suspended on this break point. And when we try to reward this page or click some buttons or something else, we see that nothing works. Uh, everything is frozen. This is a common problem. People don't know. Um, people say, why, why it happens? Like, I mean, nothing is blocking in my browser. My browser like, is frozen. And what actually happened? Uh, by default, you put a breakpoint and you just suspend it at this breakpoint. And by default, uh, IntelliJ uh, has this checkbox saying that this breakpoint will suspend all chains, including all these probes they built in of the page. And that's why nothing else works, because all other things are also suspended, and they don't give anything, any result. Uh, instead of this checkbox, often it's a good idea to put up, uh, actually this checkbox. So this breakpoint will suspend only single trade, only one trade, and all other trades will still work. And if uh, you use this option and suspend at this breakpoint, then you will see that all other things uh, actually work. Yeah. Browser works, files are downloaded, refresh works, because now only one trade is suspended, not for not all trades. This is very good technique often people don't don't know. Probably it's good uh, even a good idea to click this make default and use this by default. Uh, and uh, another great technique is uh, my favorite one when you need to uh uh, uh Okay. When you need to debug some for uh, a test, is a repeat test. Let me show. We have a test that currently working. It's clean, it downloads a file. But I know, I saw sometimes that sometimes it fails on Jenkins, for example, at some uh, night. And I go to investigate why, why sometimes it happens. And the very first, very simple technique to reproduce this problem in Slicky Test is to run it, rerun it many times. Instead of just test, I often run repeated tests. For example, 20 times. And let's run the same test 20 times. And most of the cases, it happens that some of these runs fails. Okay, in this case, I was happy that it stopped the thing very slow, but sometimes it, it fails not, not so often. Some, sometimes it fails only once in 20 times. Uh, okay, today is a today. Today it fails often. So, uh, but some, some types, this is great still. So it's, it's like it is. And, uh, so I recommendation would put repeat tests and three times as many times. It's, it's very good technique. Uh, yes, right, let's talk, uh, uh to, actually we have like five minutes, I guess. And, uh, I will, uh, I cannot talk about all topics. Just, I will just mention that if you want to depart some test not locally, like not in not in the DJ, like here. But what if your test fails only if, if you run it in Maven or in Grid? It's also possible. To do that, it's called Chevro debugging in Java. To do that, you need to run Grid with special option like minus minus debug GBM. Or in Maven there is some similar key also. 
And if you do it, then uh, Oigo will uh, start on to spill uh, this point and wait until you connect with it. And it says that, hey, I am now waiting on this port. On IntelliJ, in, uh, on IntelliJ, you can connect using this port, haven't uh, debug this remote process. To connect it again, you need to uh, create a uh, okay. lot and loop. I'm going here, and here I'm creating another uh, rack configuration. This type uh, form uh, type uh, mode during debug. I am saying here what port I am I want to use. Okay, I click debug here. And now my IntelliJ debugger is connecting to the remote process, to the Gregor process. And again, I can split break point of the expression and so on and so on. Do all the things that I usually do with debugger. This is a very useful tip that many people don't know here. Or, okay, stop the debugger. So we go. No. Uh, yeah, again, when you run one process with its option, which is lead them to this port and to another debugger process, which like, connects to this port and allows you to debug. Uh, okay, the next thing is about uh, resolving dependency conflicts. Let's probably skip it for now. This is another common topic. Uh, and uh, trade down is a very interesting topic, but again, it's quite hard to reproduce. Uh, and let's finish probably with uh, uh, what if you cannot or uh, can't replace from locally and reduce it only in Jenkins, for example. Then you cannot just debug it at any time you wish, but at least you can do something to like make it easier to debug these problems. Uh, one good option is to add a different keys uh, when you are running paste. For example, to limit memory, because sometimes test uh, has uh, problems with uh, like out of memory exception, out of memory error. Uh, probably it's a good idea to limit this memory, to pull a little bit less memory, and uh, this will force this problem like, more often. And to add this option, which says Java to take it out every time when it happens out of memory. Java, when, when your test will fail this out of memory error, Java will take your heat out, store it in the file, and later you can analyze this file. Uh, so it's probably good that you will always add such options to, to all your tests like on your build models or, or mix uh, And another good idea is to add some simple monitoring for tests uh, before and after every test. You can use map like before each, after each, right? Uh, and probably it's a good idea to walk or check uh, used memory amount of used memory, amount of free memory, and some other things that might be possible in your applications. For example, size of database pool, if it incre in increasing after some deaths, you can detect that this where some problem. Somebody is not closing connections. Uh, sometimes we walk a number of cards around new browsers. That way we could detect that one of the tests did open new browsers, but didn't close them. And again, our attentions went out of camera because of that. Uh, sometimes it's reasonable to walk a number of open files. Again, somebody is not closing files. So these things will help you to investigate some tricky context problem, which you cannot uh, repeat uh, locally on your machine, on your remote server. Uh, and it's always a good idea before the test uh, to check conditions, check external dependencies, that they are still working. This is a golden rule somewhere in uh, synonym documentation. Before each test, explicitly check for system dependency assumptions. What it means, actually, it's very easy to check. Just ask to before each method, something like that. It means this is some application that you are going to test or uh, which is needed for testing your application, some external service. Just check that this is deployed currently, that this runs at all. If some of services that is not even running, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to run your tests at all. Let uh, your tests fail as fast as possible. If something is not deployed, something is down. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, some idea what I have said. Uh, read, can, yeah, learn to read error messages. Learn to read uh, logs and start places and full start places. Learn to find the last code by 
Uh, we're going to read some of the work what we put play point to your code and to the third party code and evaluate expressions, uh, put conditional break points, uh, learn to work with dependency graph and find dependency conflicts there. Yeah, it's out of scope today. Uh, monitor environments, uh, look any resources that might be important in the application. Uh, and again, if this is out of scope, uh, learn to take trade downs and every downs and treat them sometimes. You have dead blocks, out of memory errors. It's not so common, but sometimes this happens, even in CDM and Cellarite. And it's a good idea to, to learn how to use these things also. Uh, some real things. Uh, might talk about Slacky tests in English, in Russian, and this uh, GitHub repository with some exercises you know, that yeah, you can try by yourself if you want. I am going to add more exercises here. These are uh, for very different topics, like dependency problems, naming problems, selenium problems, whatever. Uh, thank you for your attention and your question are welcome. Thank you, Andrei, guys. Oh. Thank you, Craig. Uh, awesome presentation. Um, it's like more like comments than a question, okay? Uh, I think what is important, also you mentioned that a couple of times there, is that in the long term, you also may want to invest in lock readability, right? That's one of the things that my team for working like a lot, mm -hmm. a couple of last years, is that as long as you invest in the lock readability, in the custom exceptions, into wrappers that throw custom exceptions and get them and catch them, right? It's also very important so to, to make sure that your Blocks communicating with the reader in a proper way, right? So, yeah, absolutely right. It's a good idea to invest in the readability of blocks. The only aspect that I would mention that again, prefer, like I think, prefer uh, frameworks that generate readable error message. Also, prefer frameworks that can generate blocks for you. So you don't need to manually like lock in for login, lock in for log out. You don't really need to do it manually. Many of the work, South the work can do it for you automatically. Cerematic is one of them. It can generate reports in the end of tests with all the different actions like click and so on. But yes, yes, generate it's a good idea, absolutely. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a good practice not only in tests, but in production code also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, Sure. Right, thanks. Uh, really interesting thing here in that at all. Uh, but you said about your uh, flow there uh, with floating bots. I mean, it's like a yeah. Like, yeah. like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh, you're having that, you're catching them on production, and then you can uh, retry them during outdating. Or you can predict somehow that it could be a flight attack in the future. These are the, all the things do exist. There are plenty bugs that happen in production very rarely, and also there are wiki tests that fail time to time, only, only sometimes. Yeah, these things are different. But I mostly hear often about wiki tests. This is test that sometimes is green, but sometimes is red without code changes. Uh, and yeah, I have uh, special like videos about this topic, like several videos. But so, uh, my point is again, try to investigate, try to understand what happens there, not only just here on and close your eyes. And yeah, there are multiple issues and multiple uh, ways how to fix it, how to debug it. The very first, uh, again, way is to put repeat test validation and run a thousand times. And probably one time it failed, then we can like investigate what happened. Uh, yeah. More questions? Unrelated questions? Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question. Um, you also showed how you can debug this talk a lot. Mm -hmm. But my question would be about, do you have any recommendation uh, for uh, environments, companies that use uh, 
some big infrastructure for a lot of tests for big uh, a big amount of threats and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, when you run this remotely and only remotely, this uh, rather than back practice, I would say. Uh, and yeah, you can, there is not so much that you can do about it. You can only uh, do all the stuff like that walks, that monitoring, and so on and so on. But this yeah will help somewhat, but not not totally. So my high recommendation is so so you you must be able to run all the tests locally also, even if Jenkins runs them remotely in some browser or whatever start what, then you still should be able to run them locally and not even all the tests, but any single test you need to, to be able to run. Uh, I would be clarify. Um, I'm not talking about you are not able to run it locally, but I mostly about them. For example, you're running 10,000 of tests mm -hmm. and thousands of stores. Yeah. What would you do? How do you investigate it? I would, again, one of ways is to compare the work of uh, green builds and red builds to compare the works and try to understand what was the difference. Probably uh, the most common ways is that some action was performed in different order. For example, here was first click and then download, here was first download and click, something like that. Or some JavaScript source was loaded slowly or Google Analytics could not load itself, like because of that repeat or something like that. Uh, theoretically, yeah, we should invest in logs in, in all the monitoring systems so that we could understand that at that moment something did not work, what works slowly or something like that. Yeah. But it's, it's a tricky game, more, <laughs> more was simple. Okay, thank you guys. I think we are running out of time, but I think if you have any great work, we can keep them there in the effort zone. Thank sure. you. Thank you for a very interesting speech. Sure. Yeah, exactly.